Chronicle 1 Do they dream of hell in heaven? To Mexico Barbershop Take some more off the top. In 1936, addicted to heroin, jaundice from the infernal deluge of his own language, upset at the public failure of his radical theater ideas, he sought a fresh perspective on the nature of magic and the condition of the world. He got a haircut and went to Mexico. Pass Porto. He caused a minor altercation at the passport agency. He hated the photograph. It made his hair hideous. He said he looked like Mayard. The photographer said he looked like Mayard because he was Mayard. Outraged, he broke a picture on the wall of the president. Police were summoned just to calm him down. They threw him out. Mar. There's no record of what he thought of the sea. Its vastness was likely minuscule next to the vastness of himself. He was so selfish, the very idea never occurred to him. He did write once that pelicans hover like bats over the big beachfront hotels. It's his only existing reference to the ocean. Havana. He arrived in Cuba and stayed several days. During his stay, he wrote three articles for the local magazine attacking every word that ended in ism. They were poorly received. <laughs> in bad withdrawal, he went to the sofa bar at the Rojo Luz. Had no chairs, only couches. He sat down and inquired about drugs. The Irish bartender sold him a small bottle of laudanum. It took some of the edge off until he got to Mexico. Veracruz. The beauty made his teeth grind. He felt like he was being beaten to death with a postcard. He hated it, and he took the first train to Mexico City. He arrived jittery and spent the last of his money on a glass of mezcal in a rundown room over the Pulcaria. Lecture to Empty Chairs A prestigious friend in Paris secured a speaking engagement for him at the Children's Teatro in Mexico City. The few artistas that attended were appalled and left. His subject was the idiocy of communism and genitalia. He thought it went very well. Fall. He fell down and couldn't get up. Mon Dieu, he cried. Mon Dieu. But he couldn't get up. A teenage passerby kicked him in the head. He woke up filthy in an infirmary on the street outside. A violin was playing. Do they dream of hell and heaven? Weeks later, after securing another loan from the one wealthy French patron who still had confidence in him, he left Mexico City. Suffering severe headaches and in morphine withdrawal, he traveled north on horseback into the deserts of Chihuahua to the land of the Taramara, his Indian guide was frightened of him. He thought he was El Brujo, the witch man. Mascaras. Do they dream of hell and heaven? Are they listless with their reward? 
does God spend time with his angels? Or does he show them no regard? Do they dream of hell and heaven before life on earth was done? And the golden gates forever close tight on all the fun. Chronicle 2 Angels Suffering severe headache and morphine withdrawal, he read Phantomus and traveled by train to Guadalajara. Phantomus is a serial pulp that was the rage of Paris. It chronicles the exploits of an elegantly attired killer who stalks the glittery world of the evil rich. <laughs> the evil rich are the ones who refuse to loan him money. All the artists love Phantomus. They read each new episode with great fervor and discussed his bloody antics endlessly in cafes. The author of Phantomus is anonymous. Passing villages, he looked out the window. He wondered what would Phantomus do in the state of Chihuahua. The only people to kill here are the poor. From Guadalajara, he traveled on horseback into the desert. The heat was unbearable. There was no shade and no pharmacy. The Indian guides swam up and down right in front of him. His head cracked. His stomach turned over. He threw up his face then his entire skeleton. Then he passed out. Up in the sky, a buzzard sang his bones like sheet music. Headache. Interlude from Ireland. A dream dreams another dream of dreaming. Night after night after night. The same night, the same dream, dreams the same. Inside Mexico. A Mexican peasant holds a machete after hollowing out the head of a foreign dreamer. Pieces of birds and geography and pieces of face hang fractured in the void, anticipating rats that eat thought. To France. He woke in a tiny pokery across from the church. He looked out the window. Birds crashed into the glass in front of his face. Angels. Face down, looking up. Birds fly inside his head. Feathers fall behind his tongue. Wings flutter beneath his skin. Words heard around his mouth. Songs fall out. Chronicle 3. Teatro of the Four-Eyed Man. Words come loose. Scene 1. He opened his eyes slowly. A tongue was fluttering around near the ceiling like a hummingbird. He closed his eyes quick. Scene two. Later, he took a walk through the village. 
It was full of colorful Indians avoiding him. Their faces were blank slates. He sat down on a rock and wrote. Scene one. He opened his eyes slowly. A tongue was fluttering around near the ceiling like a hummingbird. He closed his eyes quickly. Scene two. Later, he took a walk through the village. It was full of colorful Indians avoiding him. Their faces were blank slates. He sat down on a rock and wrote a story. Each morning, one dove that lost its mate cries like an injured dog. Then there is a train. Then she, uh, he, wakes up. There is no train. No dove. Only a vague hum from her, his chest. Hmm. Remember to revise. Scene three. Outside the village near the road was a small traveling carnival. The performers were asleep under the wagons. A sign on one of the wagons said, Teatro of the Four-Eyed Man. Beneath it, someone had scrawled in English. The world is on fire, and I'm in Mexico, crawling like a bug. It reminded him of something. He walked back to the village, back to the rock, and wrote. His hands itched. For a split second, he considered a single black hair sticking out near his mother's mouth. The moon appeared. A figure behind him began rubbing sticks and chanting. Then a bird flew out of his chest. Then he remembered his childhood. And the bird dropped dead in midair. Peyote. who built his black ships in 1900, who worked the edges of the water like a cart shark and walked on tall stilts. Opium. And then just walked away, motherfucker, forever. Mm. And the familiar father, before he left, must have built this one. Heroin, codeine. Scene four. That night, leery but still thinking he might be magic, the Indians asked him to participate in one of their most sacred secret acts. They sat around in a holy circle with the fire in the middle. A few sorcerers screeched on homemade violins, rubbed rasping sticks, and chanted and moaned, and then passed around a crude wood bowl full of gray gruel. Each person took a couple of swallows. 
When the bowl got to him, he thought, this is the moment I have been waiting for. Everything will break loose and transcend and be amazing and glittery and I'll feel a whole lot better from now on. The gray gruel tasted like shit, but he swallowed it. And then he wandered off from the holy circle and sat under a tree to wait for the desired effect. For all those big gates to finally open. After a while, his brain came out of his head and lodged up in the limbs of the tree along with some dreams, a few bad memories, and several disturbing things that would happen in the future. A big disappointment, especially after all these hardships and coming all this way. He thought he'd jot down his feelings about it, but his hands have turned into a couple of abstract objects he didn't recognize. Some place, somewhere. A violin was screeching, something oddly familiar. Do they dream of hell and heaven? Do they regret how hard they've tried and wish now they'd been much more sinful than repented just the minute before they died? Is there something strange about heaven? They just don't want you to know. Abstract. Chronicle 4, Rodez Volver. Notations from several disturbing things in the future. Monday. The next morning he woke up two years later. It was 1938 in France, and remained 1938 in France for the rest of the week. Thursday. He's in a pure white room and can hear tapping. Birds are pecking in the lead rain gutter outside a tiny window. Tuesday. A red rubber stick is placed and jammed sideways in his mouth. He watched crooked blue toes drag bloody across stone and saw electric switches. Something hurt. Then nothing. Saturday. He snatches a fly from the air and throws it into a spider web. The spider runs out and paralyzes it, then wraps it. Save it for later. He thinks this is how God operates. He picks normal objects and makes them voodoos. Little pieces of paper and hair and string and dust. They whisper to each other like angels. And he gives them the names of women. None had sharp edges. Sunday. He draws his own face over and over. He thinks he's drawing something else, but there is face. He drew a bird, then took a nap. Woke up, drew a bird, and took a nap. Then woke up, drew a bird, and took a nap. A doctor noted the birds didn't really look like birds. Naps seemed real. Wednesday. He names the spider Jesus. Jesus Mexico. 
because sometimes on particular days he thought he was making an investigation of someone who was investigating someone who was investigating an investigator, investigating someone like himself. The doctor gives him some music therapy. He pounds on a hunk of wood, hits it over and over with a metal rod. The rod's been beaten into the shape of a snake. He moans like an animal. It's medic it's medic it's medication day. Events of the face. He knew the power of his own face. He did numerous self portraits during his life, but None as amazing and terrifying as those he made while institutionalized in Rodez. He made himself over and over, just himself, inside, outside, wrong side, under. He made every place he never was. He drew demon beings that only came out at night. But all the images were of himself. He was a beautiful young man. Handsome as a movie star. He stared at himself in the mirror and would scream for hours. Mexique, 1936, the pain is enough to make you smile. It's so beautiful here, the other side of eternity. Waves of ancient dead flesh rolling, the sea seething with unseen magic. And beneath this strange surface moves the rigid geometry of God. The very first heart beating with murder, slipping toward land, even before dinosaurs, even before germs, drifting in the deep volumes of nothing, waiting for its moment. So black and blue and wondrous. Put the shell nautilus against your breast. Listen to the wind scream, howling with all that's unobtainable, uncontrollable. Nineteen thirty seven. Ghost ship. Over the ocean deep within, beneath the waters blue, lost inside this ship again that sails from me to you. Locked within this prison hull, chained down hell to dread. Demons rise from some siren's pull. Now that world is where I tread. 1938. 1939. 1940. 1942, 1943, 1944, 1945, 1946, 1948, tonight. Nearly crazy, he went to Mexico. He came back to France really crazy. Then traveled to Ireland even crazier than that. 
This time he was sent back in a straitjacket, chained to a cot in the dark in a rat-infested hold of a ship named the Washington, as crazy as he'd ever get. And in that state he remained, locked in one institution after the next, crazy as a loon, or stunned as a dove hitting the glass. But also oddly at his best, strange in a most brilliant and productive manner for the next ten years before his stomach began to hurt. He was diagnosed as terminal. This on top of all that terrible mentalness. So he moved on from crazy forever to also dead. Or maybe he just went back to Mexico, where it all began again. Chronicle 5 Shoe So in the black romance of this ship, the only stars to steer by are the twinkling eyes of rats. And in the dark night of Paris, sirens and whores move along the beautiful Seine, while far, far away, in quaint Rodez, a mist drifts and crackles with the stuttered light of ancient misgivings. And outside the walls, behind the lunatic asylum, nestled in the dark woods, graves in the graveyard, make slow sinking dance into the blue surface of the earth. And headstones collapse in the mist, go under like broken boats with crackpot names from the evil times. Marat, Marat, Robespierre, Marat and sweet Charlotte Corday. The first daughter of the heart. Hysteric of the hair. Zombie killer with a knife. Headless. Crazy people. One stinking grave. Sinking after another. In 1948, on the grounds of the last institution, they found him in a tiny cottage, clutching a single woman's shoe. 